You're listening to the original EER. The home of Elvis music on the web. Elvis Express Radio. This is Elvis Express Radio. I'm Joe Crine, and I have with me the author of Memphis Mafia Princes, Shirley Du. Hi, Shirley. How you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you. Now, uh, let me ask you, uh, where were you born and raised? Well, I was actually born in Oklahoma, but I was raised in San Diego, California. Okay. Uh, yeah, well, let's get, get right into the book then. Now, how did you come up with the name Memphis Mafia Princess? Well, you know, the guys will call them Memphis Mafia, and um, I was treated like a princess. So put them together, and what do you have? A <laughs> Memphis Mafia Princess. Okay. So that's pretty much how I came up with it, and, and um, it just seemed fitting. But not all the girls that were around were considered, or at least you didn't got consider Memphis Mafia princesses. No, there was a handful. Um, I I actually have put them in my book. I have one page has the Memphis Mafia princesses from the '60s, and the other one has the other page has pictures of the Memphis Mafia princesses from the '70s. Two different groups of women. It's like they pretty much all treated a men. <laughs> right. Now, uh, why did you come out with this book now? I mean, why didn't you do it sooner? Oh, I had no intentions of writing a book. I I, I never felt that um, I, I wanted to. I mean, it's just there were so many books out and so many different stories. And, and you know, the poor fans, they don't even know what to believe anymore. And um, so it was the last thing on my mind. But uh, I don't know. It was really strange. I just woke up one morning and... I felt the Holy Spirit, and I really say that because it just came out of nowhere. It says, you need to really write a book. You need to vindicate all this. And I'm like, yeah, right. I'm not going to write a book. There's no way I don't want to write a book, although I love to write. But I just didn't want to be a part of that whole thing about, you know, writing books about all this. But it just kept, you know, pounding in my head. You know, you've got to write this. You've got to write this. You've got to write this. And so finally, I was like, okay, I'll write it because... I, I wanted to vindicate Elvis. I was so sick of all the garbage that had been written about him. Uh, unnecessary uh, things that made no sense and had nothing to do with what, what the man was all about. I mean, you know, I know it sounds terrible. I mean, people wrote about his bowel movements, for heaven's sake. I mean, it was just ridiculous. So I just said, you know what? I'm going to write about the man I knew. And and then I, then I realized that the last three years of his life had always been summed up into one chapter in all these books. Nobody had really dedicated their time and energy to writing about who he really was in those last three years of his life. And everybody just assumed they knew what was going on, but they didn't. They didn't get the whole story. Now, you self-published this book? Yes, I did. And uh, it's uh, something that was it was a tough decision because I did have a couple of publishers that did want to publish um, for me, and I had a couple of agents that also wanted to take it, run, run with it, and uh, get other publishers. But after a couple of times of saying okay and handing it over and then realizing what they wanted to do with it, right. I took it back and said, it's not going to happen. I mean, when you can take a, a, one little paragraph and change the words or a punctuation, it totally changes the entire meaning. And I found out that a lot of these guys that wrote these books or, you know, they, you know, say they wrote the books, but they actually had an, uh, a writer write it for them. It's amazing how many didn't even go back and read what was written. They just got the money and ran. I know that sounds terrible, but it, but it happened a lot. So, you know, I'm sure they wanted a, a trash book, didn't they? Oh, yeah, the, the the publishers, that's all they want. They want trash and trash and more trash. And, and you know, they would they would switch the words to make it sound totally different to make it trash. And that didn't work with me. I mean, the whole thing was, you know, I, I wrote this book because I felt moved to do it. And I wrote this book because I want to vindicate all this. The last thing I was going to do, I don't care how much money it cost me, I was not going to turn it over to someone to let them trash it. And trust me, self-publishing is not cheap. No. It cost me a lot of money. A lot of money. I know. Now, the picture on the front cover, uh, you know, you look in that picture very much like Lady Di. I know, I know. But, you know, she was she was just a teenager when that picture was taken. And I have other pictures. I have a lot of pictures where 
you know, it, it's weird. I, did, I, I don't know why, but I did. <laughs> it's just the, the style, I guess, in those days. I don't know. I just I was just surprised that it didn't have a picture of, like, maybe the Hawaii, you know, when you went on the trip to Hawaii of you and Elvis. Well, you know, I thought about putting that on the cover. I, I truly did. And then I thought, you know what? This is about Elvis. And I did put pictures of Elvis on the bottom. You know, I put, you know, a strip of different. But the the book is really about Elvis and how he treated us all and the, and the fun we had. And, and just, I wanted to bring the reader into the book and let them experience what it was like. And it wasn't to bring them in there to say, okay, this is what Ellis was like. He got up in the morning, he went to bed at night, he ate this and he ate that and he did this and he did. it wasn't like that. It was like, come with me and let me show you what it was like to live within those walls with Elvis Presley and all the fun we had and what it was really like. And I wanted the reader to really feel like they were there. And based on the comments and the, and the letters I've gotten, that's, I've accomplished that, which is terrific. That's what I wanted to do. Now, uh, when did you first meet uh, Joe Spazito? I met him in 74 uh, in Las Vegas. Um, I was leaving, actually getting ready to uh, leave the showroom because, um, I mean, as much as I liked Elvis, I wanted to see him. I wasn't a real fanatic. Um, I loved his music. I had really had bought my first um, record album uh, was Elvis in Hawaii. Hawaii, I guess, Satellite or something like that. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah, and I really liked the songs. And my, my, my sister and another, her husband and another couple were in town, and I was living in Las Vegas at the time, and they wanted to go see the Elvis show, so I set it up for them to see it, but we got there late, so they wanted to set us um, separately. So I was sitting by myself, and they were sitting somewhere else. I thought, this is crazy. You know, I was sitting with strangers and all that, so I started to leave. And the third time I started to leave is when I was uh, spotted by Joe Esposito, I guess, and that's all she wrote. She, he put me in a, 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 a nice booth and said, no, 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 you're going to sit here. And uh, we were very good friends, and we dated for, I guess, about eight months before uh, we finally uh, decided that, you know, I was going to move to Beverly Hills and move in with Joe. So we lived together for about six years. I, I love how you talk about it in the book when they sat you at this table with this, there was this older gentleman and these other people and the women are gesturing gowns because that's the way it was in Vegas at the time. Not like today, shorts and a t-shirt is fine. I know, I know. Those were the days, let me tell you. <laughs> so much nicer back then. Yeah, and you, then you find out that the, the person across away from you is actually Vernon Presley. Well, yeah, I was sitting there with, uh, I, I was, he put me in the booth, and I'm thinking, oh, this must be, maybe they just do it, you know, kind of like, I don't know, just as like a nice thing to do, go put people out of the audience and put them in this one booth and go, oh, look, you know, you guys get to sit right here. How special is that? I had no idea it was Elvis's booth. I mean, somebody made a comment. What was it? And, uh, they, they made a comment on Facebook. They said, oh, well, if Shirley knew Elvis, then how come she didn't know who Dee Presley was? <laughs> Are you kidding? I didn't even know who Joe Esposito was. I knew nothing about anything except for Elvis was a wonderful singer, and that was it. I think I knew that he was married to a woman named Priscilla at one time. Um, that's it. I, I, I knew nothing else about Elvis Presley. So for me to be sitting at the booth with his girlfriend and even knowing that he was divorced, I didn't even know he was divorced, and uh, his father, it was total, you know, strange strangers sitting next to me. had not, knew nothing about them. Now, I mean, during the other tours, that, that area where you sat there, you became very, well, you would know that's where you would always sit, right? It was the well, I learned, spot. yeah, that was a special booth where his family and friends and, and you know, that was his, his entourage set in that booth. But I didn't know it at the time. Cool. Now, can you tell me about the first time that you met Elvis? Well, it was, it was, uh, it was pretty cool. I mean, we went backstage and then from there we went up to the suite and, um, you know, that was, that was really nice. Um, trying to, um, as far as him sitting in the living room and all of us sitting around and him joking around and clowning around and 
being the center of attention and everybody was just like in awe with him. And, you know, the, he was doing most of the talking. Everybody else was just doing the listening and laughing. And I, I think I write in my book too, um, he had the most incredible hands. I think that was the one thing that really I noticed the most were his hands. They were so, oh my gosh, there's something about them. They were different than any hands I've ever seen. Although, I, there was, I, I don't even know why I bring this up, but I was in New York in Manhattan and I was on the subway and there was a rabbi sitting across from my kids and I and he had the most incredible hands. And I looked at my kids and my kids looked at me and I said, did you see that man's hands? And they he, they were like, yeah, mom, they were, they were just, there was something about him. They were really special. And, and I didn't say anything, but in my mind I thought to myself, the only other person I ever saw with those hands was Elvis Presley. Don't ask me why. It's just really strange that they were so different. Goodness, there was a woman that put out a book about nothing but Elvis's hands, sketches of his hands. Because, <laughs> you know the book I'm talking about? No, okay. no, you did. Somebody wrote a book about Elvis's hands. It, no, it was just full of sketches about Elvis's hands and that. So, I like when you you speak one time about. I guess it was one of the concerts you went to, and you went up, and you actually got a uh, was it a scarf? But then you got a kiss from Elvis. Oh no, no, no! I, I was actually I had gone to um, I'd gone to a show. I don't even remember it that well. I just know that. I was sitting there. I mean, I don't know. I don't remember the incident of why I was there or how I got the tickets or anything like that. But I, I was. It was the first time I'd seen Elvis in Las Vegas, and the one I wrote about when I met Joe was the second time I'd seen him. But the first time I'd seen him, I was sitting with uh, Cher's aunt, and she was just like, "Oh, uh, she was there with an, a couple other ladies, and we were laughing, and she was saying, um, you know, how how much she loved Elvis and all that." So he started to hand out teddy bears. Well, I thought that was kind of cool, you know, because, I mean, what girl doesn't like teddy bears, right? So I ran up to the stage to get a teddy bear, thinking I was going to grab a teddy bear and go back to my seat. And then all of a sudden he decided he wanted to give me a kiss. And I was like, oh, that's cool, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll take a kiss, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know what, this is, I shouldn't be talking about this. <laughs> this is my book, you silly guy. You be here and you're me right into that one, weren't you? <laughs> yeah, I did. Okay, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you have to read my book on that one. <laughs> oh, okay, all right, I'll let you slide. Everybody's going to buy your book now and say, what the hell are they talking about? Okay. I'm sorry? Everybody's going to say, i got to go buy your book. I'm, what the heck was she talking about? <laughs> I know, well, it was kind of cool, you know. <laughs> but I found out later, I had to find out if it happened to other women, too, and it had to have. I couldn't have been the only one. Yeah. Now, when you got, mm. to, when you got to know Elvis, what kind of guy was Elvis? He was like a schoolboy. I mean, he really was. He never grew up, as far as I was concerned. Um, I mean, I was 20 when I met him, and I was a woman. 20 does not mean you're a child. <laughs> and um, when I met him, he was, uh, I felt like he was the same age as me. I didn't, he was old enough to be my father, in reality, but he didn't seem like a father. He seemed more like he was my age. He seemed more like he was 20. Uh, he acted like he was 20. He laughed. He joked. Uh, he was just so much fun to be around. It's, it's to think of him as being that much older is just, it, it just didn't, I didn't comprehend it that way. Right. Now, can you tell me about the first time that you uh, went to Graceland? The first time I went to Graceland, it was, uh, well, Joe and I stayed at the Howard Johnson's. We didn't stay at Graceland, um, but it was only a few, few blocks down the street. Um, I was totally shocked when I saw there was an Elvis Presley Boulevard. I remember looking at Joe saying, wow, he even has a street named after him? How cool is that, you know? And so um, we went to Graceland. And um, that to me, you know, again, I, I, I don't want to seem naive, but I really, I, I didn't know any of that. I didn't know there was an Elvis Presley Boulevard. I had just heard about Graceland. Graceland was Elvis's home, and he called it Graceland is all I knew. And at that point... So when we went there, I, I wasn't sure what we were going to see. And it was a beautiful home up on a hill, not too high of a hill. But, uh, and then the gates opened. And, of course, I was like, oh, wow, look at the gates. They have, like, a little scroll of Elvis, you know, and a guitar, you know, and, and just things like that. I was so, it was surprising to me because you have to understand, I didn't know any of this. So this was like, you know, going into a... Um, opening up a door and not knowing what was behind it. I had no idea what I was in store for. 
So when we pulled up, we went to the back, and all these fancy cars were there. I remember seeing the Pantera and the Stutz, and uh, they were pretty cool looking to me. And so then we went to the back door, and um, it was a screen door, and I can remember it was just, um, you know, the South was so different than California. So to me, you know, I've been living in Beverly Hills. Actually, no. Was that? I can't. I can't remember if that was before I met, uh, before I moved in with Joe, or after. I think it was. It was before I moved in with Joe, and um, the um, it was just. It was just interesting to go through the back door and and see, you know, the maids were in the kitchen cooking, but they didn't seem like maids, even though they were wearing uniforms. They were just like part of the family. You know what I mean? It was almost like your mother was in the kitchen cooking, and uh, the guys were hanging around and around in the den and watching the big advent, the big screen TV, and, um, you know, everybody was just friendly and happy and joking and, you know, Mm -hmm. um, most likely watching football because that's usually what they were watching and uh, just joking around. It was, um, and then, of course, Joe gave me a tour of the house and went downstairs in the basement and showed me the TV room and the billiard room and, uh, you know, I thought it was really funny. I talk about in my book about there was all these doggone ceramic, white ceramic monkeys. They were downstairs. They were in the dining room. They were in the living room. They were everywhere. Somebody liked white ceramic monkeys. I'm assuming it was Elvis or Linda, one of the two. Oh, and that's when I met Linda for the first time. I didn't know that Elvis had a girlfriend named Linda. I thought Sheila was his girlfriend, but then I guess he had two girlfriends. Yeah. Probably a lot more than that. Yeah. I don't know. Right. <laughs> Now, um, what did you think of the decorating of the, uh, Graceland? Uh, well, I thought it was, let's see, for back then, I think the, the most impressive thing to me was that big screen TV because we didn't have big screen TVs back then. I mean, you know, the biggest TV you found was, I think, a 22-inch 20, or 27-inch, which was like humongous, but this thing was like a huge, uh, probably 62-inch screen, or 60-inch, I think, actually. And uh, it was, it had a projector going, it was just, to me, that was real impressive. And um, then uh, the fact that, Elvis, you know, Elvis's bedroom was like, he had a huge bed that was bigger than a king-size bed. And then what was really interesting is how he had two TVs in the ceiling, right. one on the, you know, for his side and one for his girlfriend's side. So they could lay down and put their head on the pillow and see the TV in the ceiling. And then, of course, it was Lisa's room, which was like a hamburger bed, we called it. Uh, it was a white round bed with white fur, and it had like a top on it. And we all called it the hamburger bed. But, um, yeah, it was pretty interesting. You know, a lot of people wish they could go up there, and you're one of the few that has. Yeah, it's um, it's kind of cool, I think, that they don't let people up there, especially in the bathroom. I think that would be a little grotesque. Yeah. I think that this. You know, some things are just meant to be left alone and sure. that door closed, you know. I agree. Okay, did you get along with the, the Memphis Mafia, all the Memphis Mafia guys? Yeah, um, I think they got along really well. I mean, there was no bickering, fighting, uh, no gossip, no uh, talking behind each other's back. It was really pretty cool. It wasn't until the end, right before Elvis uh, fired... Uh, the infamous bodyguards that um, talk started to go around and and uh, people were, you know, not getting along so well. And then, of course, that incident that happened to me, yeah, we'll which there. was not very nice. <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> uh, how about the, you know, it had to been hard, though. How about the, they had wives, they had girlfriends on tour. Did it get hard for you to know who you could talk to about someone else? You could, I mean, it had to get hard. No, no, no. I, we actually, you know, it, it was so funny. It, it was, we were all so innocent back then. I mean, today, I don't think I would have been so innocent. I think I would have probably asked more questions or I probably would have blown it. <laughs> you know, I don't know. But back then, it was like, it was just accepted. You know, these guys had a wife and they had a girlfriend. Not all of them. There was one or two that didn't, but most of them did. And um, if I say who the one or two are, then I would be saying who wasn't. So I just keep my mouth shut on that. So, um, But we just, we just kind of, 
you know, kept things to ourselves. Although, I did say, I remember very, very clearly me looking at some of the girls and saying, listen, don't ask me and I won't ask you. Because I knew if I asked a girl something, because I was on every tour, so, you know, it was kind of hard for Joe to cheat on me on tour anyway. Um, but I knew if I asked them any questions that they were going to ask me questions. And I didn't want to answer their questions, so I didn't bother asking them any. And they probably felt the same way. So we all pretty much just pretended that it didn't go on. Okay. Sure, but we all know it did. Hold on for one second. This is the Elvis Request Show on Elvis Express Radio. All right, we're back with Shirley Dew. So, so it must have got hard. I mean, when you were talking to girlfriends, I mean, the girlfriends realized that they were there. And when they're not there, that the wives were there. I mean, wasn't the girlfriends constantly trying to get one of them to marry them? I mean, it had to get confusing. That wasn't confusing. I knew exactly who the mistresses were, and I knew exactly who the wives were. <laughs> It was, it, was, uh, it was a really close-knit group. I mean, um, you have to understand, on Ellis's plane, there were a handful of people. You've got all the band members and all the crews and all that. They flew on a different plane. So what they did was totally different than what we did. Right. So I didn't even know those people that well. I mean, I, I knew who they were because Elvis introduced them on stage and all that. But uh, I knew who Kathy Westmoreland was, and I, I knew her because she would be a stand-in in in between women when uh, if one was flying in or something, because Elvis always liked to have a woman with him. Right. And uh, then, of course, Myrna Smith was Jerry Schilling's girlfriend, and she was always there, um, which... You know, that's one That's one guy I can say never mess short out because she, Myrna was always there with him. So as far as I know, he was always faithful to Myrna. Um, but, um, yeah, so we, we were, it was, it was easy to remember who was with who because of uh, the small group. It was a very small group. It wasn't as big as a lot of people think it was. Okay. Hey, did you get along with Priscilla? I do. I, I I think the world of her. I think she's totally misunderstood. Okay. Uh, I have a letter uh, I'm just going to read to you quick that was uh, sent to me, and they wanted me to ask you this question, okay? It says, in the book Child Bride, Shirley Dew is quoted many times by Susan uh, Feinstead, and she doesn't have much nice things to say about Priscilla. She is quoted as saying that Elvis never asked Priscilla for a re- reconciliation, and that Priscilla even made fun of him behind his back when he came over to her house to visit Lisa one time. She was even quoted as calling Priscilla a lying bitch in that book for making up the story of Elvis coming over to her house and asking for another chance. Now in your book, uh, Shirley Dew supposedly speaks much more friendly about Priscilla and she says that it's true that Elvis did ask Priscilla about another chance. So what is it? Uh, Well, Suzanne is the author of her book, and I'm the author of my book. And like I said, I wrote my book, so it went straight from my head, my heart, my pen, or my fingers on the typewriter to my book. So this is what was. What somebody else quotes me as saying is not necessarily what I said. Okay. So you're saying you were misquoted. Absolutely. Okay. And so was Joe. Joe was misquoted terribly in that book. As well, I mean, that was Joe was was very upset about uh, the quotes in that book that he said that he he never said at all. Now, the, I will say that she was Priscilla was laughing at Elvis when he was going around the Ferrari, showing her the Ferrari, and I was angry about it, and I confronted Priscilla about it, and I had egg on my face because I'm the one that was wrong. Because what she was laughing at was his pajamas kept slipping out from underneath the snowmobile suit that he was wearing. And he kept trying to hide it. And she kept chuckling. And I didn't see it. And she did. So that that part is somewhat true, what she said in her book. Uh, but the other is grossly uh, misquoted. Okay. Uh, did you get along with uh, Linda Thompson? Did, well, did you get along with all Elvis's girlfriends? Oh, Linda Thompson, oh my gosh. she's Linda Thompson and I were not close, I will tell you that. But Linda loved Elvis, so how could I not love her? I mean, she truly loved him. She made him happy. 
And I heard him laugh. I, he smiled and he giggled and he had lots of fun when he was with Linda. So how can I not love Linda? And same with Sheila. Sheila used to make him laugh. He loved Sheila's. Oh my gosh. Uh, he, he, um, I'm sure you've heard the story about he wanted her to come, um, on tour and she was, uh, dating Jimmy at the time and she didn't want him to know that she was dating Jimmy Kahn and well, who she later married, as we all know, but, um, Elvis made the comment. She said she had a cold, and he said, well, he was going to get the pilots to fly low so <laughs> it wouldn't affect her cold. He was, very, he, he was crazy about Sheila, and, of course, we all know he was in love with uh, Anne Margaret and uh, very much in love, uh, still very much in love with Priscilla, and Priscilla was still very much in love with him. Yeah, I mean, that's not uncommon. People divorce a lot that still love each other, but their careers are getting away and they can't have a marriage, a normal marriage. But a lot of times people end up by getting back together, you know? I mean, that happens a lot too. Well, you say in the book that you felt, and I, I do too, that uh, Elvis always had a love for Priscilla. Oh, you could see it on his face. I mean, it was easy. I mean, he's... He's like a schoolboy. He absolutely adored Priscilla, and Priscilla knew it, and she teased him. She she would tease him, but she still loved him, too. And she told me herself that she was still very much in love with Elvis. Did Elvis want her back? I believe he absolutely did. Based on what I know, he did. Yeah. Okay. Uh, somebody wanted me to ask you, did you ever get caught in the middle between Sheila Ryan and Linda Thompson? I mean... Mm. You, you, I'm trying to think about that. I uh, sort of. Uh, I know that Linda um, Linda didn't like Sheila, but that was, you know, I mean, that was really the only only girl that I ever heard of that, that Linda felt a little threatened by. But um, I, she, I, <laughs> she, I, let's just say she she wasn't that crazy about Sheila, but she wasn't she wasn't bitter about. She left. She just wasn't crazy about it. Like most women wouldn't be if they found out that their boyfriend was seeing some other girl. Sure. She was normal, human. She most people would have felt the same way. Sure. Okay, I'm not going to go into the next one yet. I want to bring up something about uh, something that you write inside your book. Okay. And it's, okay. Uh, deception is a chapter that we're talking about, and you 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 kind of hit on it earlier in the interview. Uh, can you can you say what happened? Well, I'll touch on it, but, you know, I don't want to sit here and read my whole book to you. You know what I mean? Um, no, there was an incident where um, a few of the guys that uh, were eventually let go, and this was part of the situation that led up to them being let go, uh, decided they were going to interrogate me about something that supposedly I said. And the sad thing about it was, I was completely innocent in the whole thing and had no idea what they were even talking about. And I eventually proved to them that I didn't know what they were talking about. And instead of them apologizing to me, uh -huh. they, um, they, they never apologized. They just threatened me after that and told me I better not. Well, maybe you didn't, but you better not. You better not say anything. Maybe you didn't, but you better not. Which was really unfair to do to a, a young girl that was completely innocent of anything. But, you know, they got theirs in the end. Right. Now, again, I don't want to, I don't want to catch you off guard, but uh, I got a, I got something from uh, DeGrobe in the, in the, uh, an email. And I'll, I'll read oh, good. Oh, good. Good. Okay. I've been waiting for this. Oh, okay. Dick Rose says, because I did send him, I sent him an email, by the way, and told him, you know, Dick, I am putting this in my book, and I just want you to know I'm giving you a heads up. You know it's true, and I know it's true, and everybody else that was there knows it's true, so I just wanted to know how you feel about it. And I sent him an email, but he never emailed me back, so I'm very anxious to hear this one. Let's hear it. Okay, well, I can, I can only uh, read parts of it to you. And he says, uh, I can find no one who recalls anything like that nor do I have any memory of it and cannot find any tape, although I have a number of tapes, including some of her and Joe, including phone calls. So my first thing to you is, the, why the taping? Wait, 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 excuse me. You want to back that up and read that again to me because I didn't hear that, that something he has, something of me and Joe. Yeah, it says the memory of it and cannot find any tape, although I have a number of tapes, including some of her and Joe including phone calls. Now that is exactly what I was told and allowed to read 
on the air. Wow. He actually taped Joe and I talking on the phone? That, let's see. <laughs> Jeez. That's what I was allowed to say to you. And uh, did he do that? Wow. Well, I, I guess that speaks for itself, doesn't it? <laughs> Okay. No, there's, there, trust me, there, there are a lot of people that know about that incident. Joe will back me up on that. And um, well, Charlie, unfortunately, has passed away. He can't, David Stanley, he says he will, but, you know. Um, Linda Thompson was there, and um, I have a couple of that. I don't want to mention them on the air, but, uh, yeah, no, the, the, it definitely happened. And if he doesn't remember, I, maybe it's due to his age. I don't know. <laughs> What did you think? What did you, what did you think when you got? In? I'm sorry. What did you think when you got in the room and you saw a tape recorder? I don't know what the heck was going on. All I know is I was coerced to go in there, and I'm like, "What? What? What's this?" Okay. And it was, you know, the old, the old sit down, sit down. Yeah. Oh, you know what? This is this is just ridiculous. I mean, I I, I can't believe I'm, I'm I promise I didn't want to go into detail about this because again, it's part of my book. Right. Right. <laughs> I mean, because you don't even say it as a tape recorder, and and for a little bit, a while, while I was reading your book, I thought they were getting ready to hook you up to a lie detector or shock you, or I wasn't sure what it was. Yeah, I I, I had no idea what was going on. I was totally shocked. Uh, again, I was totally innocent. So you know, having having not knowing what they were talking about, and then having to call somebody and bring that incident up. Mm -hmm. Um. You know, it, it was, um, I don't know, it was, it was scary for a young girl, and I didn't know what was going on. And then with Red West poking his finger in my face saying, you better never tell Dad anything I do, or I'll kill you. I mean, it just, uh, it's very scary. And if, if Big Grove wants to pretend it didn't happen, he knows darn well it happened. I mean, he's talked to other people and never, ever, ever said it didn't happen. This is the first I've ever heard him ever saying it didn't happen. And he and he has never said it didn't happen to anyone. Okay. Because they gave him the perfect opportunity to deny it, and he never did. Now this whole situation angered Elvis, and I, and I can see why. And, and you you say in the book that this is one of the reasons why the three gentlemen that that wrote Elvis what happened, why they were let go. Yes, it was it was it wasn't the reason, but it was part of the reason. Okay. That was part of the reason. Because they like to say that they were let go because they tried to help Elvis and, and blah, 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 and stuff like that. Well, we all know that's yeah. a joke, don't uh, we? Yeah, we know. A joke? I mean, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, yeah, I never saw anything like that from those guys. They were, they, you know, whatever. I, I, I could go on and on about that, but I won't. But it does make me angry. Okay. And then while, we're, while we're doing this little interview, I think it's hell of an incident that did happen. Okay. That I think that that the all the fans would like to know. Okay. Um, Joe Esposito is an honorable man, and as much as he disagrees with what Red Sonny and Dave Hebler, who nobody would even know who Dave Hebler was if he hadn't written that book with them, um, but Joe and I and Martha, his late wife, who is a dear friend of mine, and um, that's a whole different story. Um, we went to an opening of a, um, the Coons Ransom in Las Vegas. The three of us went together. And um, while we were there, Sonny showed up. Well, there was a whole thing about Sonny not being there and Sonny being there, and, and Joe wasn't going to go because Sonny was going to be there and blah, 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 blah. And uh, so finally, it ended up that Joe was there and Sonny showed up. Well, Joe, being the gentleman that he is, realized, I assume, that you know, at our age, this is ridiculous, meaning him and Sonny, I'm a lot younger than him. <laughs> but, um, this is ridiculous that we're in the same place and we can't even talk. So Joe actually went up to Sonny, and this was about 2010, I think. Okay. Went up to Sonny to shake his hand. And Sonny started yelling at Joe, calling him every name in the book. I literally stood between the two of them. Sonny was trying to hit Joe. Okay. So if that tells you what a gentleman Joe was and what kind of person Sonny was to do that, I, I you know, I wanted to, I wanted to punch him myself. I wanted to punch Sonny myself for even 
coming near Joe. I mean, how dare him? Here is a man that comes up to him after he wrote that that awful book, and Joe's coming up to him to shake his hand, and he's gonna he's gonna hit hit Joe. I mean, no. that's ridiculous. Yeah, I, I have so, to... I'd like for it to go on record that Joe Esposito did try to make amends with Sonny after he wrote that god-awful book and what he did to me, and Sonny tried to hit him. Okay, now I should say that if Dick Grove wants to come back on the show, he's been on the show several times, and say his side of the story, and he's more than welcome to do so again. If uh, Sonny West would like to come back on the show again and, and say something about you, what you just said, he's more than willing to do oh, that's so. That's fine. Equal air. That's fine. My, these guys know that I'm telling the truth. And if they deny it, then you know what? They're going to have to answer to a higher power than me. Because what they're doing is, is, is covering up what really happened. I mean, it's ridiculous. Okay. I mean, come on. Dick knows. Dick, I cannot believe, is denying what happened in Colorado. If he's denying that, then let him look me in the eye, face to face, and deny it to me, to my face. Okay. Okay. Because I'll, I'll take him on. I mean, I, you can put me on the radio with him because I don't, I don't have any problem. Because you know what? As long as I'm speaking the truth, I have that, that, the truth is behind me. The truth is right there, so I have nothing. I have no fear. As long as you tell the truth, you have no fear. Okay. All right, I got some other questions that uh, people on the web wanted to ask you, okay? So uh, what was the funniest okay. thing you ever heard Elvis say or do? Well, of course, I think the funniest thing is when, when he asked Joe to take the pictures of him and I in Hawaii, and as soon as I go, he put me down next to him, he started sticking his tongue in my ear, and I couldn't, I couldn't stop laughing, and Joe was trying to take the pictures, and, and then, then he would act like he'd stick his tongue in my ear, and then he'd face the camera like he never did it, and it was just it was really funny. And um, I'll just... Um, Let's see, what were some other things he did? Oh, uh, just in the movie theater, you know, cutting up and and talking, you know, doing the actor's lines in, in an English accent, you know. Just little things like that. He he was he was always the prankster, Halloween coming downstairs, scaring all of us, none of us recognizing him, you know, making us think we were being burglarized or robbed. <laughs> he just he was funny. He was a laugh. Okay, uh, you mentioned about your ring in the book, and someone asked a question. Did you ever find out who took your ring? No, but I'm absolutely sure it was the bartender at the Hilton. It was uh, whoever he had set up. go in my home while I was at work. And when I when I go back and I remember the looks he gave me, the phone, he was talking on the phone, looking at me, how he had been behind me in his car just the night before. It just all the pieces just fit, you know. But what are you gonna do? Did you tell Elvis about it? Oh yeah, yeah, no Elvis knew about it. You know, was, that was shortly after that. When I read when that, he got in the car. When I read that in the book I thought, gosh, if she told Elvis about that, Elvis would probably send the guys after him. He was that kind of guy. Well, but see, I didn't know who it was. I didn't accuse anyone because I didn't know for sure that it was the bartender. But as I've grown older and wiser, I'm about 99% sure it was done through the bartender at work. Okay. Hey, um, looking back, when, uh, when do you think was Elvis's happiest time? Because so, like, what years did you know Elvis? Well, I met him in 74, so, you know, I don't know that much about before me, yeah. except for what I've read, um, which you can't believe how much you read anyway. Okay. <laughs> That's why I wrote my book, because I got tired of reading all the garbage, but, um, so, I mean, as far as his, the happiest time of his life, well, I would obviously say, like, like being a parent is probably when he had his daughter. I mean, but that's just, you know, I'm not Elvis, so I can't speak for him. I can just, you know, speculate like everyone else. How was he when his, I'm, I mean, I know, how was he when Lisa was around? I, I did, explain to me the Elvis that was there when she was around compared to the Elvis when she wasn't around. 
Well, he was either pretty much the same. I mean, like uh, when when he would talk, he yeah. didn't act any any different around her. I mean, he was he was a father to her. He treated her like his daughter. Although I never saw him raise his voice at her. Um, he didn't really swear in front of us women, so he never swore in front of his daughter either. Um, he didn't do anything that, I mean, he was pretty G-rated around me, so he was pretty G-rated around his daughter as well. See, one of the other uh, guys that I've interviewed, they said to me that uh, Lisa could get away with anything. Oh, she could. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. That's true. <laughs> Yeah, she she was a pistol, but you know she was she was a cute little girl, and she she was like any other girl her age, really. It had daddy wrapped around his finger, her finger. Emotional most little girls do. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Somebody <laughs> else wanted to ask: uh, Could Elvis have turned his life around if he had the right people surrounding him? Could Elvis have what? Could Elvis have turned his life around if he had different people surrounding him? I don't think there was anything wrong with the people surrounding him. I mean, why would somebody say that? Um, the, the people around him, even those who betrayed him in the end, still loved him. Uh, I think that, um, you know, Judas loved uh, Jesus, but he still betrayed him. Right. Um, you know, I, I, I think that uh, I don't like the guys that betrayed him. Betrayed him, but um, I don't. I don't really deep in my heart. I don't doubt that they didn't love him. I know they loved him, and and um, I think we all wanted to help him. But um, in this day and age, if anybody has ever been around anyone that has a, a, an addiction to medication, whether it be street drugs or like Elvis, um, you know, prescribed drugs. Um, in this day and age, I think we've learned that uh, they have to help themselves. We can't do it for them. Right. Now, the book, uh, What Happened. Did you ever talk to Elvis one-on-one -on -one, uh, about what that book did to him? You didn't have to. You could see what it was doing to him. Um, you know, it's it's really sad. Um, I've learned a lot since, since I've written this book. I mean, you... you you know, I, I've become a, a bit of, you know, without being um, overzealous here or whatever, a bit of a celebrity. I mean, you get all these people wanting to ask you questions, wanting to know you, and oh my gosh, they can be brutal. And, and you know, you, you do something out of love, which I know Elvis did out of love um, when he sang, and, and, and he went up on stage knowing that he was overweight and not understanding why he was overweight, uh, and I wish to God they wouldn't have given him prednisone because that's what made him look so puffy. But um, him not understanding it, but yet he still got up on that stage out of love for the fans. And then people would ridicule him and call him fat. Um, you know, then his bodyguards went out and and uh, wrote this, this terrible, terrible book about him. And you want to tell me that didn't break his heart? Of course it broke his heart. I mean, every time, you know, I hear someone say something um, that I know uh, that's done out of um, um, hate because they want to defend, um, you know, Rosemary Alden, for example, so they come after me. I mean, it's so, it, it's mean, it's cruel, and it's done to hurt me. And when those guys wrote that book, it was mean and cruel, and it was done to hurt Elvis. It's the same exact thing. And you know what? It's not nice, and it hurts. And it hurt, it hurt Elvis, and, and it hurt him bad. And, he, and he, he was, it was terrible. It was terrible. And if you don't think it didn't affect him, you're wrong. It affected him terrible. I'm sure it did. Uh, yeah, wanted... and it, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I mean, it's just, and here he was with with um, a new girl that he had just just met. He was trying to impress her. At the same time, he was being ridiculed. I mean, imagine what he must have been going through emotionally. I can't imagine, and especially when they nowadays say that that book was written to help him. You know what? They 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 didn't write that book. First of all, they didn't write it. 
another a guy from the National Enquirer wrote that book, which tells you what kind of book it was right there. So these guys, you take three guys, and you know it's 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 like that. Um, Oh, I, I forget the name of it, but if you if you take one person in war, and and you make him um, the cap the the capture, or, you know, where they they've taken him prisoners. The one person will not harm the prisoners, but you bring two other uh, other guards in, and between the three of them, they will feed off of one another, and they'll end up by by torturing the the prisoner this is what they did to Elvis they had three guys that were trying to outdo each other and did everything they could to try and come up with even more to hurt Elvis that's what they did and they try to say oh we were only trying to help him excuse me I don't think so okay somebody wanted to know did you ever try to date Elvis <laughs> did I ever try to date Elvis <laughs> right. they, they, ask, they ask I'm asking <laughs> no okay. no Elvis was like a brother you know, I, I don't, I know, no. I mean, I, I had the opportunity several times. I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. He hit on me more times than I wrote in my book, but no, no, I'm not stupid. Well, then you said he would also turn, you thought that he loved you more because he knew that you were so faithful to Joe and that you felt sometimes maybe that's what he was seeing if you were faithful. faithful. Well, you know, and that, that's true because I talked to Priscilla about it and I said, I laughed. well, it's kind of a joke, but I just, I said, well, you know, because she read my book and she read my book a couple of times. She absolutely loved it. And, um, I said, so I said, I think, I said, but I think that he was, he was just testing me to see if I really did, you know, if I was there for him or Elvis, I mean, for him or Joe. And so she started laughing. She was, no, <laughs> he was hitting on you, Shirley. I said, no, he wasn't. <laughs> and so she just laughed at me. But, uh, no, he did say several times that, he, that um, he loved me because he knew how much I loved Joe. As a matter of fact, that's the last thing he said to me. Okay, and if, if uh, Priscilla would like to come on the show and talk about what you just said, I'd be more than happy to talk to her. So <laughs> I wish she would, but I, you know, honestly, I, I uh, she she's been a, a a a true friend when it came to uh, loving my book, and she said anybody ask her about the book, she she has no problem in telling them how much she enjoyed it, and um, I just don't really like to involve her in the book. Um, because of the things that I've said, um, it's my story, and I don't want anyone misinterpreting it as being her story. Okay. Okay, uh, did Elvis have a nickname for you? I mean, he had so many nicknames for everybody else. Did he have one for you? Mm, no. No, not that I think I know. <laughs> I, know well, I know now what it is. I didn't know what it was back then, but he used to look at me and say, thank you, Shirley. Thank you, Shirley. Okay. Thank you, Shirley. <laughs> but you don't know what that is, do you? No, I don't. It's from a film. It's from a, it's from a, a silly movie. To which, I don't want to say. Anybody that's seen it will know what I'm talking about. Was it a bad movie? Well, it was a it was a comedy, and it was I'll put it this way: there was there was a there was a guy sitting at a desk, and there was a there was somebody underneath the desk, and he stood up and he said, "Thank you, Shirley." Okay, okay. <laughs> My mind was going to the right place, but okay. Did, did oh, you... but that, he used to say that to me a lot, and I I just everybody would laugh, and I was I was so naive, I didn't know till later what he was doing, what he, why he was joking. Did you get along with uh, Ginger Olin? Yeah. <laughs> we knew that was coming up, didn't we? What a vicious <laughs> laugh. My goodness. I mean. Oh, God. Um, um, well, when she, when Elvis were alive, was alive, um, did I get along with her? I was cordial. You were what? I was cordial. You were cordial. Okay. Wow. Don't keep talking. <laughs> okay. Are you are you purposely going to skirt anything about Ginger? Am I purposely going to what? Not talk about Ginger. Um. You know, that's the guys have tried to explain, and whoever has tried to explain that whole situation. 
it's it takes more than just a couple of sentences to explain that whole situation. Um, and I think I handled it really well in my book without ridiculing anyone or calling them a liar. I thought you did. Um, I thought you were very nice, actually. Yeah, I was truthful. I was honest, and I wasn't judgmental. But I tried to tell the story of what was without um, ridiculing anyone. And I, I tried my best to be as honest as I could without um, claiming to know what Elvis was thinking or what Ginger was thinking or what Ginger's mother was thinking. But I did tell what I saw and what I knew. And that's all I can do. I mean, I can't, you know, I'm not going to make up anything more and I'm not going to say, well, it was this way because I believe it was this way. I just tell what I know and I let the reader decide what they want to decide. Right. Well, did Elvis ask her to, to marry him? Hmm. I mean, it's history. That, again, is the question that I tried to answer in my book without giving it a yes or no answer and letting the um, reader decide on the answer themselves. Okay. Okay. Um, you kind of threw me for a complete ringer here. Um, I'm sorry. I mean, it's just, you know, I, I, it's just, it's very difficult. Like I said, people have tried to explain that whole situation, and the only way you can really hear what happened is to, to see it from the beginning to the very end and come up with your own conclusion. Okay. But I will tell you this much. He had every intention of going back to Priscilla. Okay. Uh, but you you do know that on the last tour he was going to meet up with a different girl. Oh yeah, we all knew that. And Ginger was on her way out. We all knew that. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I'm going to have to <laughs> skip that question and that one and that one. Okay. Uh, couldn't you see? I mean, at the end of Elvis's life, that the the tours was just getting to be too much for Elvis. I mean, did you see that or? Well, I know that Vegas was getting to be too much for him in the end. I mean, that, that was brutal, and they did break that down. You know, they cut it down to one show a night instead of two. Uh, the touring, you know, no, I don't think it ever was too much for Elvis because Elvis loved to entertain. Okay. Okay. Well, we're going to... Um, so. All right. I'm just going to... And, and he loved having his own plane, too. You have to understand, now... He had his own plane, so it's much easier for him. He could get on that plane and go back in his bedroom and sleep the whole time, or read, or whatever. All right, Shirley, we're just going to take a quick break. Well, it's hard to be a gambler betting on the number that changes every time. When you think you're going to win, you think she's giving in. A stranger's all you'll find Yeah, it's hard to figure out What she's all about But she's woman through and through She's a complicated lady So call her my baby
I learned very early in life that without a song, the day would never end. Without a song, a man ain't got a friend. Without, without a song, the world would never bend. Without a song. So I keep singing the song. This is EER, Elvis Express Radio, the original internet Elvis show.